Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. Joining me and returning to the podcast for episode number two is Dr. Mariana Kakuti, a researcher at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Kakuti, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks very much for being here today. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me again. I look forward to sharing this uh, study that we did with you. Dr. Mariana, in case someone uh, has not heard our first episode, would you give them a little bit of background on yourself and what you do at the university? Yeah, so I am a veterinarian and I've been I've done most of my training in public health epidemiology. So I have a very epidemiological and data analytical background. And I joined the University of Minnesota in 2018 with the MSHIM for the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Program. Um, and uh, this is one I uh, actually of the first projects that I was involved in with, which is the cell mortality study. You know, we think of MSHIM as uh, disease sharing. So sow farms share their PER status and sometimes even their PED status. So we get an idea of the incidence of outbreaks. But as I understand it, you looked at some um, performance data from some sow farms. Not all of the MSHIM sow farms, but one producer was willing to share some specific performance information and allow you to do some of your statistical analysis work. Exactly. Yeah, we are fortunate enough to have a very uh, a very interesting group of people that participate in MSHIMP, and some of them are actually willing to share those uh, important data that we need to look at from time to time to understand what's going on more than just looking at the diseases, right? So we are very fortunate to have those people uh, with us in this project. Yep. And um, being the sow farm, uh, you looked at one of the kind of more heavily discussed challenges we deal with on sow farms today, which is sow mortality. You want to talk to us a little bit about the uh, mortality data that you were able to take a look at and then how you started the data analysis part of it? Yeah, so we actually were able to get for this particular project, we had one participating system that was willing to share data for four farms with us. Uh, and we have mortality records from 20, uh, 2009 up to 2018, so almost 10 years of data for each of those farms. Those farms are located in the Midwest. So again, it's only four farms from one production system, so we have some issues with representativity there, but it just gives us some idea of longer term, um, of a longer, longer term assessment of mortality, right? Uh, we looked at about 350,000 cell uh, service records for about 85,000 animals throughout that period. So we looked at a lot of data. Large population of animals, even though it just came from four farms. Exactly, exactly. And these farms had um, what we would consider to be not just good sow mortality, but probably excellent sow mortality levels. When you looked at their annual sow mortality, these were not problem farms. In fact, they were the opposite. They were an example of sow farms that can still have exceptional sow mortality numbers. Exactly. And the... And the project that we're going to discuss here today, we actually plot uh, weekly mortality for these herds uh, in in the paper. And you can see that the basal mortality is pretty low with, and we have some really high spikes of mortality probably involved with an acute event. Um, and we try to understand, you know, looking at the broader context throughout the whole decade of study, what's more associated with mortality, right? Very good. Well, why don't you take us into the data, Mariana? Um, what sort of analysis did you do on this large data set? And then we'll start to talk about how we can interpret that analysis. Yeah, perfect. So we looked pretty much uh, at the mortality records uh, through three different lenses. So first of all, we looked at the basic description of uh, mortality, right? So how many cells died? When were they dying? Uh, how old were they when, when they were dying? And for that, we actually saw that most of the cells, as was previously described in the literature, die, they usually typically die uh, around the peripartum phase. So maybe around 110, 16 days uh, from, from the last service, right? Um, the medium parity when they die is usually around two. So they are very young cells as well. Uh, and then looking at the reasons for mortality that were recorded in the data set, uh, most of the reasons are going to be associated with locomotion problems or reproduction problems. Uh, so this was the first, you know, analysis that we did, just describing the cells that died. 
The second analysis would be uh, the weekly percent of sows that that were present in the herd that died, right? So we wanted to see what was associated with an increased uh, weekly percent mortality. Uh, and for that, we looked at environmental uh, variables such as uh, temperature from the nearest airport, season. Uh, we also looked at uh, whether or not the, this uh, farm was uh, had an ongoing first outbreak throughout that week, uh, whether or not the farm had a pen gestation or a group housing um, pen during gestation or if they were housing individual stalls, stalls uh, whether the farm was filtered or not. But we also looked at different metrics such as uh, the amount of labor dedicated to each stall, right? So we calculated average number of stalls per hour per employee. And we also looked at feed medication. And with that, we saw in the end that uh, spring weeks were actually associated with an increased um, week mortality during the during spring weeks compared to winter. And then we also found surprisingly that uh, feed medication was also associated with a higher uh, weekly mortality as well. And the rationale that we think uh, that is behind that is that instead of using feed medication as a prophylaxis, this feed med medication is actually capturing uh, the overall health of the herd, right? So they're probably being applied because the, the herd is sick. Uh, so we are probably capturing something else other than just, you know, the feed medication. So that was the second part of the analysis that we've done. And then the third one would be, we wanted to look at the individual risk of a sow dying. So what, what makes one individual sow uh, had an increased risk of death? And then for that, what we did is we looked at the whole a lifetime of a sow during that uh, period of time in the herd. And then we looked at similarly the same uh, risk factors such as parity, whether or not the animal was exposed to any first outbreak throughout their lifetime, uh, whether or not they were housed in pen gestation or individual stalls, um, if, they were, if the farm was filtered, and the season at first service, right? And then with that, we found that um, Parity was associated with risk of dying. So the younger parity, again, have a higher risk of dying compared to older parity. So we know from the field that those first few farrowings are crucial, right? And the ones that survive tend to survive better to other stressors. Uh, and then first outbreaks were also associated with increased risk of south dying. Um, again, probably because it's an acute event, right? An acute stressor. Um, pen gestations were also associated with a higher risk of dying, which was interesting. But however, I would like to point out that uh, there is an important caveat here that we had only one farm that converted to pen gestation. So again, representativity might not be uh, very accurate here. Uh, and then filtration was also associated in an inverse uh, manner in the sense that uh, the risk of dying reduced if the how if the cells were housed in filtered farms. And that makes sense, right? Because you're likely introducing less uh, infectious diseases, so you have less stressors in the cells lifetime. And I think that pretty much sums up <laughs> our findings and our method. L-Biotics, the pioneer postbiotic for digestive health in pigs, brought to you by Adair Biome. With over a century of experience in postbiotics for digestive health, L-Biotics contains heat-treated lactobacillus cell bodies and their metabolites. Stable by nature, L-Biotics can be easily stored and incorporated in compound feed. Well, thank you for coming on the show again, uh, Mariana. It's been tremendous to have you as a guest, and you do excellent work. I really appreciate what you do for the MSHIMP team um, and then uh, what you do for uh, sharing that information with us. Um, to everybody out there in the audience, thanks for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com, and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on our weekly episodes. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mariana, for coming on the show again. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we hope to have you on for the, the groundbreaking third time. If you can get scheduled again here soon, you'll be the first one to survive three different podcasts. That would be perfect. Thank you so much. Excellent. For Dr. Mariana Kakuti, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. 
If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to take a look at your research.